COVID-19, the disease that has put all of our lives in limbo. The disease that has brought the best and the worst out of society. Something we claim to have been to the mountaintops with. Something we all seem to know far too well. But in reality, we know nothing about the effects of this enigma. Or we choose not to know the effects of it. Do you wear contacts or glasses? If so, take them out. Or if you have neither of the options I listed, simply sit put. Now, for the people who took off their glasses, I want you to think about this. You were born with a slight visionary impairment, which doesn't mean you're any lesser than your counterparts who don't have glasses or contacts, right? It's something you were born with, but nobody blatantly discriminates against you because of it, correct? Nobody's going to judge you solely on that one aspect of your life. You're a multi-dimensional person. Something as minimal as something you didn't even decide on at birth shouldn't decide your fate in society, correct? Or on the other side of the spectrum, you not needing glasses or any other visual enhancer doesn't make you outright superior simply because of something you were given at birth. It doesn't give you the okay to psychologically and mentally manipulate your counterparts or solely focus on that one aspect of their lives, basically annoying the person that they have become on their own fruition. Oftentimes, it's better to introduce subjects with great magnitude slowly. That's what doctors say when people are given medications administered by direct IVs, so I have to follow the same approach. The glasses reference was in no way, shape, or form the subject of today's video, but it's a watered down and less controversial depiction of the social constructs that have plagued the United States. Discrimination and racism. Some would think that the phenomenon of human compassion would come out during these hard times and that the government would step up and serve all of its people. But in reality, we're seeing the opposite. We've seen our president call the disease the China virus, creating a surge in hate crimes against the Asian American community, causing many members to live in a state of fear. We've seen COVID-19 rip through the indigenous American community due to lack of funding and support given from the government who sits on their rightful land. We've seen them struggle as the government gives them reserves that oftentimes aren't even habitable. We've seen them struggle for years on end. And with COVID-19, all of those problems are servicing to the extremest degree, all because the highly appraised United States has jeopardized their livelihood from the day they got there. We've seen the African-American community and Black community continue to be unjustly murdered by the police and the system that continues to move the finish line and throw in obstacles that make surviving in a country that hates us even harder. We've had many members of the community living in a state of fear of death by COVID-19, pre-existing diseases caused by systematic oppression, or an armed force that is supposed to be protecting us. We've seen members of the LGBTQ and queer community risk their lives, worried about the prospect of COVID or being hate crime by their own families. We've seen the mental health of the community reach record lows as the pandemic rages on. We've seen the healthcare system, whose job is to keep us healthy and safe, discriminate against them for no good reason. We've seen many in the Hispanic and Latinx communities struggle to make ends meet and to keep their families afloat as the government continues to neglect them from the support they need. We've seen the government keep their kids in cages at our border, do science experiments on their women and break up their families, sending thousands off to be aliens in countries they've never even been to. We've seen them be put in concentration camps that are breeding grounds for outbreaks of COVID-19 and other diseases. We claim never again. We promised them never again. But here it is again, almost 80 years later. We all may be going through the pandemic, but not all of us are in the same boat as not all of us have the pre-existing disease of systematic oppression. While many of these marginalized groups shared the aspect of having oppression as a pre-existing disease in times of COVID-19, it would be wrong to clump them all together, stripping them of their individuality. Hence, let the show begin. When we think about the continent of America as a whole, we forget that this land is centuries old and that its history didn't start once the colonizers arrived. The continent of America was never ours to begin with, but we should respect the people who were here first. This is their home and we are guests in their home, correct? 
President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act in 1830, authorizing the federal government to forcibly relocate Native Americans in the Southeast in order to make room for white settlements. For the next two decades, thousands of Native Americans died in hunger, disease, exhaustion on a forced march west of the Mississippi River, a march known as the Trail of Tears. Decades later, in 1887, President Glover Cleveland signed the Dawn's Act into law. The Dawn's Act forcibly converted communally held tribal lands into small, individually owned lots. The federal government then seized two thirds of reservation lands and redistributed it to the land of the white Americans. The Native American families who were allotted land were encouraged to take up agriculture despite that, despite the fact that much of the land was unsuitable for farming, and many could not afford the equipment, livestock, or other supplies that were needed for a successful enterprise. This was systematically done. The result was erosion of tribal traditions, the displacement of thousands of families, and the loss of nine million acres of valuable land. They were placed into mediocrity by none other than the oppressor. So it's plenty fathomable why some members of the community might not instill their trust in people who slaughtered their families and culture. While tribal nations have experienced a reinsurgence in self-governance and self-determination in recent decades, the legacy of displacement, oppression, and neglect in the American public policy affects the Native communities to this day. Native people endure some of the highest levels of financial insecurity in the country. In 2017, more than one in five Indigenous members lived in poverty compared to the rough percent of eight in the white American community. They're also less likely than their white counterparts to own homes and more likely to be burned with the cost of housing. Even when they do own homes, they're worth less than those of their white counterparts. These blatant disparities in housing and economics are due in part to the past public policies informed by manifest destiny that strip native communities of land, wealth, and opportunity. In the aspect of COVID-19, many indigenous Americans live in food deserts or possibly areas that have very low hospitals per capita. These low numbers result in crowding in the ones that are considered focal points for many, thus causing breeding grounds for COVID-19. There's also the issue of pre-existing diseases, many regarding eating habits, since many dietary traditions within the American indigenous community were eradicated during the 18th through 20th century during the boarding school regulations that stripped the communities of their culture and their wealth, reprogramming them into the American Euro norms. We can talk about the fact that General Kit Carson burned down hundreds of cornfield anchors in the 1800s and then proceeded to put hundreds of thousands of Native Americans into concentration camps for four years, threatening them, saying that the only way they ever be free is if they gave over their children to a system that put their kids in boarding schools that took out all of their traditions that they knew and loved and placed in mentalities that basically made them slaves to the colonialist and capitalistic ideals. This is a cultural reset. This reset is the root to many reasons why they have pre-existing diseases regarding the health of many indigenous Americans since they are stripped of not only their culture and their loved ones, but the dietary norms that they have perfected over the decades. Now, pre-existing diseases like heart failure, hypertension, diabetes have infiltrated the indig indigenous American community, setting them back in the fight against COVID-19. So be honest with yourself. Would you really put your trust in a system? It doesn't matter what aspect of the system, educational, healthcare, economics. Would you put your trust in a system that basically injected the pre-existing disease of oppression so they could reign superior over you? Would you put your trust in a system that has had its knee on your neck from the moment they sailed to your land? The, so the shores you called home, but now they call their property. Would you trust that? The death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and all the other beautiful black faces that were murdered by the police created a chain reaction of uprising, both for and against the simple phrase, Black Lives Matter, meaning no, we will not tolerate your systematic slaughtering of our sisters, brothers, and children. It caused many to step out of their comfort zone and stand strong as lifelong allies striving for progress and the dismantling of white supremacy, the thing that roots back to the seeds of the United States. While others simply took it as a trend, another 2D fad that didn't affect them directly, and was therefore deemed skippable. 
Black Americans are affected with COVID-19 at nearly three times the rate of white Americans, according to a news document from the National Urban League. The report, based on data from John Hopkins University, also shows that Black Americans are twice as likely to die from the virus. According to the State of Black America, the infection rate for Blacks is 62 per 10,000, compared with 23 per 10,000 for Whites. Latinos see even more infections, 73 per 10,000. The study reports that Blacks were more likely to have pre-existing conditions predisposing them to the COVID-19 infection, and less likely to have health insurance, and more likely to work in occupations that do not allow remote work. Oftentimes, those occupations don't pay the same amount as remote jobs would, Hence, not only putting the adults at a disadvantage, both economically and physically, but potentially the children that they house as well. A major layer to the problem was and still is the murdering of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The murdering of these two beautiful Black people opened up a can of worms for the country. And every time a Black person is unlawfully murdered, it does something to one's mental health and soul. Depression, anxiety, and several other mental illnesses have spiked in the Black community. These illnesses could oftentimes start a chain reaction that oftentimes causes other diseases to surge in the body. And it doesn't make it any better that oftentimes mental health is vastly neglected in the Black community. Regardless of the statistics, there is one thing that rings true, and that is that these statistics will always be slightly off, as many Black people either don't have health care or choose not to trust the healthcare system in general. Hence, there will always be a large margin of error to count for the people who chose not to seek help from the American healthcare system. Many Black people in America do not trust their healthcare providers who act in their best interest. Researchers expose that Blacks are much likely to have faith in doctors and hospitals, so they're less likely to seek care or comply with the approved treatment plans or ideologies. There's also the fact that historically speaking, it makes sense why Black people aren't going to put their trust in the American healthcare system. For instance, Black people were forced to participate in dissections and medical examinations in the antebellum period. Dead Black bodies were a continuous source of surgical examinations, oftentimes robbed from their graves. White American physicians later concluded during the Restoration period that former slaves would not flourish in a democratic society because their minds could not deal with the freedom mentally. The definition of schizophrenia was used by psychologists during the civil rights era, era to depict Black activists as violent, aggressive, and delusional because they challenged the racial status quo. And later in the century, the Tuskegee syphilis study, where syphilis was purposely prescribed and refused medication from hundreds of Black men without their permission. Some may say that that was then and this is now. But many of the medical workers that we know today adopted those sorts of thinkings and continued to implement them in their work. Casting out history will only broaden the problem. Efforts to improve the health outcomes for the Black Americans must acknowledge the brutal history and shadow casts from decades of discrimination and the resultant collective distress within the community. Because the Black, Latinx, and Hispanic communities have all experienced similar aspects of oppression by the U.S. economic system, social, and healthcare systems as well, it is only apparent that their narratives cross paths. Many members of the Latinx and Hispanic communities have experienced the issue of having to choose between protecting you and your family's health or living on the verge of losing your job and not having enough to provide for your family. It makes it all the worse that ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement sector of the U.S. government, has continued to do raids in the midst of a pandemic, searching for immigrants, regardless of who the officers and officials may be exposing, and regardless of the families who are being separated when everything else in their lives are so fragile. And then there's the aspect of being discriminated against, hindering their abilities to get jobs and protect their families due to their race and or mother tongues. There is also the fact that the holding grounds at the U.S.-Mexico border have the essence of concentration camps, breeding grounds for COVID outbreaks, and ridden with childhood trauma that will stay with these kids and the generations to come for the rest of their lives. These camps don't follow CDC guidelines at all, and oftentimes people are shifted place to place, the camps overflowing with different people on a daily basis. Different people because the United States is still shipping out people to countries away from their families and into countries that many of them have never been to. 
the people are in tight spaces, stripped of now their supposed luxury of common hygiene. The living quarters are small and ridden with children who have been kept in a country they don't even know, watching as their parents get shipped away, probably to never see them again. The women are being exposed to new diseases and stripped of their humanity as scientists on the border perform research on them, oftentimes without their consent. Does this remind you of something? Within the U.S. borders, many families live in households that are often housed with extended family. Tia and Theos, followed by primos and abuelos, all under one roof that wasn't made for this many people. It makes potentially quarantining the sick relatively impossible. COVID-19 doesn't discriminate. A host is a host, and one person can wipe out an entire household. Latinos are overwhelmingly represented in the essential worker population of the U.S. and have undoubtedly been overexposed to the virus as a result. There is also the issue with people who have pre-existing diseases. A lot of those pre-existing diseases stem from systematic oppression. Let's think about it. Let's take diabetes, for example. Hispanics have a higher risk of developing diabetes than anyone in the U.S. general population. 2.5 million, or 10.4% of Hispanic and Latino Americans aged 20 and older are reported to have diabetes. Hispanics are more likely than non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks to have undiagnosed diabetes as well. Almost half of the Hispanic children born in 2000 were expected to have lifetime diabetes as their lives progressed. Would it surprise you that one of the most unhealthiest and sugariest drinks on the market, Coca-Cola, has strictly and excessively marketed to the Hispanic and Latinx community. What about the fact that the Hispanic and Latinx American community strictly not being able to get in the economic playing field during the 1900s has set them up for a health-based failure that they are experiencing as we speak? Because poverty gives you the make-do mindset, many recipes and eating habits oftentimes are made from cheap, unhealthy foods with the purpose of nourishing you for the toils of tomorrow, not for the toils of a lifetime. These habits have been passed down through the generations, and with those habits come diseases that the future generations are susceptible to. Think heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, the whole nine yards. In order to stop this, we as a society have to go back to the roots of the system that put these beautiful people there in the first place and take apart the system that is still in place today before it unlawfully takes any more lives. It's time we stop blaming the oppressed and start looking at the faults of the oppressor. According to the poll released by the Morning Consult on behalf of the Trevor Project, more than 40% of LGBTQ youth have reported that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected their ability to express themselves. One third said that they were unable to express themselves at home, the poll found, and nearly a third of transgender and non-binary youth reported not feeling safe in their living situations since the start of pandemic. That poll also highlighted the particularly severe impact among Black LGBTQ youth, 78% of whom reported that the pandemic has had a negative impact. The LGBTQ plus community has been affected quite differently than many of the other affinity groups that I analyzed prior. Better yet, their oppression can be split into two aspects, mental and physical. While everyone one way or another has been mentally impacted by the pandemic, the LGBTQ plus community has to grapple with the fact that their living standards may not accept them for who they are. To put it into perspective, many members of the LGBTQ plus community use school as an outlet to be their authentic selves, whether that be high school, middle school, lower school, or university. Because of the shutdown, many had to return home to families that could be blatantly homophobic, prone to gaslighting, or people who no longer see them as who they used to be, all because they want to be who they authentically are. For mental health treatments and other healthcare needs, including hormone replacement therapy, many LGBTQ students depend on student health insurance. All students struggle with social connections and belonging, but isolation can be particularly harmful to the LGBTQ students, especially those who do not have caring family relationships. At the rate of people losing their jobs and homes drastically increases, the risk continues to skyrocket for LGBTQ people. Several regulations shooting transgender people from discrimination in healthcare and homeless shelters have been reversed by the Trump administration. 
which even more people are likely to use in the aftermath of COVID-19. In times of health or financial crisis, LGBTQ individuals have even less of a support network on which they can rely on, resulting in not just their medical health being affected, but potentially their physical well-being being affected as well. The high burden of HIV queer men has also led to marginalization, although it's uncertain if COVID-19 presented an increased risk to individuals living with HIV, it is clear that COVID-19 has affected the healthcare system, making it much more difficult for individuals living with chronic conditions such as HIV to see their healthcare providers in person or feel comfortable going to a pharmacy to get their drugs. With COVID-19 comes the vulnerability of being predisposed and more acceptable to the disease. And with this vulnerability comes the hard decision of putting yourself at risk to make ends meet or to maintain your health, drastically affecting your livelihood and ability to provide for yourself. There's also the aspect that many members of the LGBTQ community may not have as much faith in the American healthcare system based on how sloppily they handled the AIDS and HIV epidemic, placing degrading and incorrect labels on the men of the queer community and working with no haste at all as members of the queer community died, all because of the blatant homophobia that has plagued the system whose sole purpose is to help us. These problems have been here for decades. The problems in society aren't solely in 2020. They've only been amplified. And they aren't going anywhere once the clock strikes midnight on the 31st. I chose not to include the Asian community in the Dirty Pacifics part because their case is quite different. Due to the main servicing of the coronavirus being in Wuhan, China, the disease gained a really bad rep internationally, causing the world to look like a group of children pointing their fingers at one child who had a problem instead of potentially helping that child in need. There was a surge in harassment, assault, and general hate crime in the United States under the president's fruition all because of his wording. Casting the word foreign, the virus is not a mere rhetoric flourish. Between March 16th and March 30th, the president used the word Chinese virus more than 20 times, according to the database of the website Factbase. A photographer even caught the transcript of his speech in which Trump had crossed out the word corona and replaced it with Chinese. The intentionality of his wording was made clear. Connecting the virus with a race is extremely problematic. The, the direct identification tracing back to a method called othering, traditionally used in anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy, the process talks about the group identities with explicit medical language, the kind of language that triggers anxiety, fear, and disgust towards any individual affiliated with that group. The phrase foreign virus also alludes that the nation is a body facing an external threat. Such language means that the border blocks out the dirty, malignant, aliens um, from an uncontaminated, homogeneous, and somewhat pure society that the United States portrays itself to be. The language then seeps into the country, deeming anything that is considered to be supposedly unpure as an alien, stripping them from their human rights and culture as an American citizen. It's unfair and unjust. To take a more personal approach to this video essay, I decided to take a survey both within my close friend group and my general Instagram follower population. In total, I received 70 participants plus the additional 95 from people sharing the survey around, thus creating a pool of 160 participants across the country and 15 from outside the country. This act will revolve around the viewing of the statistics found within the survey. The respondents will remain, of course, anonymous due to confidentiality. But because this section has information coming not from my own mouth, I prefer to let the participants speak for themselves and let them woo you with their authentic opinions. So to them, thank you for being a part of the progress that we seek.
The respondents gave their honest answers about what they'd apply to the raging pandemic, and I've given you the insight on the America you may not see on a day-to-day -day basis. Now the ball is in your court. What will you do with this information? Will you take it and continue to educate yourself in order to better yourself and the others in your community? Will you simply hold on to my words for a couple seconds and then let them fade as you continue your day? Will you go headstrong, claim that my words are radical and exaggerations, all because they threaten your bubble life that you've continued to thrive in at the expense of others? Because it doesn't apply to you, therefore you treat it as a trend or the enemy to your narrative when in reality it's just our livelihoods. Or will this video push you to do something, something, something as grand as using your strongest weapon, your voice, something that has grown in value as our country grows more and more divided and COVID-19 continues to take the ones we hold dear. You have the information now. What you do with it is decided solely upon your own fruition.